Hello there. In this video, let's talk about polar coordinates in space. And specifically with this video, I really want to try and make these ideas as general as possible, right? So while I'm going to be talking specifically about polar coordinates in this video, these ideas, right, if I make this video correctly, we should be able to understand them and be able to apply them for any coordinate system that we're interested in, okay? All right, so let's get to business. So before we even think about our coordinate system, first we just need to think about the nature of space, right? So in physics, we model our world with Euclidean, right, space. Uh, and specifically, right, because we're talking about polar coordinates, which is a 2D system, we call this the Euclidean plane, okay? And for right now, I'm going to make an emphasis that we're dealing with a Euclidean geometric plane, right? And I'm going to contrast this down the road uh, when we introduce like the notions of vectors, right? But for right now, I'm just saying that we have a Euclidean geometric plane. So what does that mean, right? Okay, so Euclidean geometric space, right? is basically just going to match common sense, okay? That's that's the main thing I want to get across here, right? It, we have a continuous set of points, right? Uh, you know, parallel lines in Euclidean space are just going to look like, well, normal parallel lines, right? We can measure the distance between points, right? With a, again, a distance metric that is going to match reality, match what common sense tells us. Right. If you wanted to get more technical than this, you could look at, uh, you know, Euclid's uh, geometric postulates. Right. Right. But the main point is, is that right now we're just locking in. Look, OK, I've chosen this Euclidean plane. It's going to have a proper structure that is going to match, you know, physical reality to a very good extent. And of course, this is going to be in 2D because we're confined to a plane. But let's get to the more interesting part. Let's go ahead and start actually thinking about our uh, coordinate system, right? So here I have a point here, and I'm going to go ahead and call this point P. Okay, and point P is lying somewhere in our Euclidean plane. And right now, because I don't have coordinates, I can't really do much with P. So what do I need to do? I need to define a coordinate system, right? So what we do is we're going to put an origin down. In the case of polar coordinates, we can refer to this as the pole, right? And in the case of polar coordinates, we have to define a polar axis, okay? So here we have our polar axis, right? And the way that we're going to locate P here in polar coordinates is I'm going to go ahead and define a radial distance, okay, call this R, and of course this uh, distance here, this line segment that I have here, is going to create an angle with my polar axis, which I'm going to call theta, right? So point P is going to be located at some R and theta, where I just determine the exact values of R and theta, you know, corresponding to whatever point that I'm interested in, P. All right, and I'm going to put a little subscript here that we're working in polar coordinates. All right, so next I'm going to do something that should seem maybe a little bit weird at first, okay? Right, I'm going to introduce Cartesian coordinates into my picture, okay? I'm going to go ahead and draw, just like normal Cartesian coordinates, I'm going to draw an x-axis and a y-axis. I'm going to choose to align my x-axis with my polar axis. In which case, we could definitely see that this point P here, right, is going to, so P in my Cartesian coordinates is going to have some component X, some component Y, right, X comma Y, right? And we can write this in terms of our polar coordinates. How can we do that? Oh, look, just use a little bit of trigonometry. This is going to be R cosine theta, R sine theta. Right, so we've written our Cartesian coordinates just in terms of our other polar coordinates, right? Now, why am I saying that this is weird? I'm saying that this is weird because, well, quite frankly, it seems very unnecessary. Why bother doing this kind of roundabout way of converting my r and theta into some x position and y position, right? 
Th this seems unnecessary. Why can't I just stay in the polar coordinates? Why don't I just keep things simple and say, no, you give me an R, you give me a theta, I go out some distance R, measure an angle theta, there's my point. Basically, the reason why is because Cartesian coordinates are very special. And I'll talk about exactly what I mean by this uh, in a bit. There's more to it being special than just like, oh, it's the common sense, you know, way to locate a point, right? An X position, a Y position seems very common sense. There's more to it than that that makes Cartesian coordinates special. So anytime you introduce like a new coordinate system, it's a very good idea to make references of it in Cartesian coordinates because uh, you can do a lot of useful stuff that way. But before I get to like the rigorous what makes Cartesian coordinates special, we can even see that like on some level it's easy to formulate ideas in Cartesian coordinates, okay? So what do I mean by this? Let's, let, let's consider distance between two points. So now I'm going to have this point P and I'll go ahead, let's throw in another point Q, okay? And now let's go ahead and say that this P is at, you know, x1 comma y1 and q is at x2 comma y2 okay in which case what would the distance be in cartesian coordinates right the distance between these two points oh well of course we would just end up using pythagorean's theorem right so we have the distance between d between p and q is simply going to be equal to, right, the square root of, right, this leg is x2 minus x1. So x2 minus x1 squared plus, and of course the height is y2 minus y1 squared, y2 minus y1 squared, and awesome, right? But then the point is that distance was really easy to formulate in Cartesian coordinates. And now because we have this conversion here, right? Now I can plug this, these guys in for x2, x1, uh, you know, y2, y1. And we're going to get, you know, a formulation like this that we have, you know, this, of course, we have to use subscripts also. So I'm going to have like r2 cosine theta2 minus r1 uh, sorry cosine theta 1 squared right you extend this square root out plus r2 sine theta 2 minus r1 sine theta 1 and there we go and now we just came up with an equation for the distance between p and q in terms of polar coordinates you see how easy that was? Oh, I forgot to put a square here. Um, but you see how easy that was basically once we had uh, Cartesian coordinates and then we were just substitute in, right, the polar representations of these uh, Cartesian coordinates, right? And so we'd also, of course, we'd be able to simplify this down with some trigonometric identities. I'm not going to do that in this video, but we would end up getting the square root of r1 squared plus r2 squared minus 2r1 r2 cosine of theta 1 minus theta 2. Okay. So cool. Now we have a general equation for distances between two points in polar coordinates. So far, great. We've established that we can locate points with r and theta. Cool. Next, we want to start imagining what happens if I change r and I change theta, right? So first, let's go ahead and imagine keeping r fixed and we go ahead and change, you know, some finite amount of theta, right? In which case, I'm going to get an arc, right? Because I'm keeping my radius fixed and I'm just changing the angle of theta. And ultimately, we can, uh, you know, traverse a complete circle in this way, right? I can go through and change theta at this fixed r and make an entire do 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 circle, right? And we can do this, we can do this at a bunch of different R's and we can start visualizing these curves here, right? We can start visualizing curves. And likewise, right, we can do the exact same thing. If we hold theta fixed, hold this guy fixed and just start varying R. Well, in this case, what are we gonna get? We're going to get like this line here, 
right? And we could do this for, you know, again, a bunch of different set angles theta. We could draw out a bunch of these radial lines and, you know, we'd end up getting something that looks like this, right? But you see the method here. You see what I'm doing. I'm saying, look, imagine holding one of your coordinates fixed and then varying the other one. And then you're going to, in that way, you're going to generate coordinate curves. Right, so just, just to really emphasize this point, these are curves of fixed R, and these straight lines are, you know, curves, I'm putting in quotes because really they're lines that we end up getting, curves of fixed theta. Right, so coordinate curves are very useful uh, qualitative descriptors of coordinate systems, okay? But the other thing that we can do by imagining varying r and theta is we can come up with a very quantitative uh, thing, which are called area elements. So instead of imagining finite changes of r and theta, instead I'm going to imagine, you know, creating infinitesimal changes of r and theta. And let's go ahead and do this from this point P. I'll go ahead and do this in green. So from this point P, okay, Go ahead and start by imagining that we keep theta fixed and we increase r by some amount, some dr, okay? And next, keeping r fixed, we go ahead and imagine changing theta by some amount, right? We get this little arc here. And what's this arc going to be? Well, it's going to be r times d theta, correct? Right? You know how an arc length works. You take the radius times the change in angle and you get r d theta. Okay, here's the point. Go ahead and put together what this, uh, you know, what these two lines, they're going to create an area, right? Which I'm going to call d a. And in the infinitesimal limit, right, where d r and d theta limit towards zero, this dA is going to go from looking like a little sector here to basically a little rectangle, right? It's going to limit down towards a rectangle with side lengths r d theta and dr, which means the area element dA is just going to be equal to r dr d theta. Okay, so this is the next thing that you really want to define for your coordinate systems are area or if you're in a 3d system you really want to define volume elements right and these are the infinitesimal area elements created when you change each coordinate uh you know by some infinitesimal amount and they're very useful for setting up integrals all right before i move on the last thing i'm going to do is again i'm going to make another reference to cartesian coordinates right in cartesian coordinates the area element would, you know, we could imagine varying x by some amount, we could imagine varying y some amount, and we would get a square that looks like this, dx, dy, and we would very trivially find that the area element dA in Cartesian coordinates is equal to dx, dy, okay? Now, kind of the, the next kind of question here is, hmm, I wonder if these area elements, right, between these two coordinate systems, can be related just like how we were able to relate points right between the two coordinate systems all right so let's go ahead and summarize what we've covered so far so far we've said that if we have a euclidean space and we're considering it as a geometric space we can define these concepts for our polar coordinate system we can define ways to locate points we can define a way to you know come up with distances between points we can create qualitative coordinate curves at fixed r and at fixed theta, and we can define area elements, okay? So just considering Euclidean space in a geometric point of view, we've already done so much. That's a lot of power that we already have, but in physics, there's a big problem with this, okay? And basically, you know, a really key issue here is that we can't add points together, okay? We can add distances, we can do stuff with distances between points, but the points themselves, well, that's kind of the point, right? They're fixed in space. 
but in physics it would be really really helpful if we had another set of fundamental mathematical objects which we could actually perform operations on it like addition okay and then the other thing that we really didn't address although we kind of showed that it could be helpful right by coming up with the distance formula in polar coordinates using cartesian coordinates but we didn't actually address like this fundamentally of what is so special about these cartesian coordinates why is this kind of the gold standard coordinate system that whenever we introduce a new uh, coordinate system like polar coordinates do we care so much about you know about rewriting cartesian coordinates in terms of that new coordinate system okay so this is another question that i need to address right and in order to do this and we're going to explore this in the next video okay and we're going to need to upgrade our language uh, upgrade our structure here we're going to have to turn our Euclidean space, with which we've been considering purely as a geometric space, into, you know, a Euclidean displacement vector space, I'm calling it here. What exactly do I mean by this? Well, I'm going to have to talk about this in the next video. But yeah, take a breather and be happy, you know, with all of the things that we were able to do, just considering Euclidean space, you know, in terms of geometry. And now, once we're feeling good about all of these ideas, then we're ready to level up, if you will, and, you know, talk about uh, this guy here, okay, which will be the next video. But anyways, if you found this video helpful, if you enjoyed it, let me know in the comment section below and consider subscribing to the channel. I really do love to hear about people getting on board the channel. But other than that, thank you so, so much for watching.